Hello, this is Dr. Adam J. Bach. Welcome to MHR 322, Introduction to Entrepreneurial Management. In this short video presentation, I'm going to talk you through a quick introduction to entrepreneurship, some basic information about myself, and the information that you'll need about the course in order to succeed this semester. Entrepreneurship has been defined in many ways. One of the classic definitions is provided by Schumpeter, that of creative destruction, the idea that entrepreneurship brings innovations to the market, new commodities, new technologies, new sources of supply, or even new types of organizations. These then make older technologies or businesses obsolete, or even completely change industries. Another really interesting definition is from Stevenson, the pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources you currently control. This is a really nice definition that helps explain how entrepreneurship works in practice because many entrepreneurs pursue ide ideas where at the start they don't really have the skills, the resources, the finance, the assets necessary to actually be successful. And the first step of the entrepreneurial process for many of those individuals is actually acquiring the necessary resources they're going to need. Finally, I want to just share my own perspective about entrepreneurship. I see entrepreneurship as something more broad. Any situation where someone sees an opportunity and takes action to create change seems to me to be a type of entrepreneurship. This obviously applies to a much broader range of activities outside of, for example, for-profit business. So you need to be careful with that one because it would include an awful lot of people that traditionally might not be considered entrepreneurs. But I think it's helpful to recognize that entrepreneurship happens in a lot of contexts that we often do, we might not recognize right away. And I'll encourage you to think about that more later on in the course. Why is entrepreneurship important? Entrepreneurship has a significant impact on a society. It's the dominant form of job creation in the United States. It's part of our dynamic economy, this process by which new ideas, new innovations, and new technologies are brought to market. Without entrepreneurs, we wouldn't see the rapid advancement in technology and capabilities. And finally, entrepreneurship is what makes it possible to bring innovations to consumer at scale. That is, rather than simply have an idea and share it with a few people, entrepreneurship is the process that makes it possible to bring innovations and ideas and technologies to thousands, millions, or even billions of people in a reasonable period of time. Second, there are many career benefits to having an understanding of entrepreneurship. In the last 50 years, career paths have become dramatically more dynamic. People tend to have more jobs in their lifetime, and those jobs tend to be different or to require more personal initiative. Even large companies are looking for employees who are more innovative, employees who can think a little bit differently, rather than just be given an assignment and told what to do. Corporations, including the largest corporations, are looking for employees who can bring a new perspective and a new understanding of how markets change and how ide new ideas get to market. Finally, although I would argue this is the least important, being a successful entrepreneur can generate wealth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but also caution, uh, provide you with some of the cautions around that particular issue. As a couple of examples, the Forbes 500 list for individuals provides a few folks from Wisconsin who've been very successful entrepreneurs. Some of these individuals' names may be extremely familiar to you if you are from Wisconsin, and some might be familiar to you if you're not from Wisconsin. The found John Menards, the founder of Menards, Herbert Kohler, the founder of Kohler Corporation, Diane Hendricks, ABC Supply Company. You might not be as familiar with that one. ABC Supply provides a variety of building and other types of construction materials. You might be very familiar with SC Johnson, a company that provides a sub substantial number of home and kitchen cleaning products of, along with a variety of other consumer products. And then Judy Faulkner of Madison, uh, whose health uh, e-records company Epic System is now the dominant player in digital health records. All of these Wisconsin entrepreneurs have become incredibly successful uh, using entrepreneurial thinking to create and grow their organizations. At the same time, I believe it's important that you choose to be an entrepreneur for the right reasons. 
although these examples are wonderful examples and obviously you're familiar with many others such as Mark Zuckerberg or the founders of Google uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page uh, the reality is that most entrepreneurs do not become wealthy. It is a, po a possibility for individuals to make a great living, to provide for their families. But the examples that we've just talked about are outliers, the individuals who make millions and billions of dollars. They are outlier examples. The vast majority of entrepreneurs do not become wealthy at that scale. And my suggestion is that if you're in it for the money, then there are probably better ways to get there. If all you're really interested in is trying to generate some income, then first you might consider a corporate job because those are stable and provide excellent income with benefits like health insurance uh, that you might not get as an entrepreneur. And there are specific industries and sectors where you can generally be expected to do quite well, and those are areas that we teach here at the School of Business such as finance or real estate. I believe that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you should become an entrepreneur because there is something you want to accomplish and entrepreneurship is the best way to do it. And I love this quote from Judy Faulkner, the work of my life has been to develop software that would help keep people well and help sick people get better. And that was why she founded Epic. Now there's no question that she saw there was a business opportunity because she knew that that was how this was going to work. It wasn't going to be possible to generate a successful uh, digital health records uh, system with government funding or through some type of grants or as a nonprofit. It was going to have to be a business. But this statement that she never had any desire to be a wealthy billionaire uh, is also proven by some of the choices she's made since she became successful. Since Epic has become a global success, Judy Faulkner has pledged 99% of her personal wealth to charity after she dies. And so, uh, and there's wonderful stories about how wealth has not affected Judy. And I, I think that this is really the key lesson is that you should, if you want to become an entrepreneur, do so because there's something you want to accomplish. I want to just tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. Um, I have a background in engineering originally. Um, I did my MBA at UW-Madison uh, and then a PhD in entrepreneurship. I've taught at a number of different universities and institutions. I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I've co-founded five uh, biotechnology startup companies. Uh, two spun out of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, some of those companies have been very successful. Nerides was acquired for $20 million in 2011, and Stratatech, and the company, one of the companies I founded out of UW-Madison, was acquired for $187 million in 2016. Uh, I was co-founder and founding CEO of a company called Virtual Incision, spun out of the University of Nebraska that's raised more than $20 million in venture capital and is uh, still pursuing the commercialization of its surgical robots. And more recently, I spun Cellular Logistics out of UW-Madison, uh, and I served on the board of directors and also interim CEO of that organization. Uh, I've been directly involved in helping place $10 million of venture capital investments into early stage startup companies. I've done a lot of strategy consulting, executive education. Uh, I consult to technology transfer offices and sit on board of directors. And so I hope to bring some of this experience uh, to this course. Uh, and I encourage you, if you have questions uh, more specifically about my entrepreneurial experience or my finance experience, you are more than welcome to reach out uh, and I would be happy to share stories wherever I can with you. This course gives you the opportunity to learn about entrepreneurship and to practice some entrepreneurial skills and behavior. My hope is that you'll develop an entrepreneurial mindset because I believe that can be used in your life and your career no matter what you choose to do. You don't need to be an entrepreneur to be in this class. You don't even have to want to be an entrepreneur to be in this class. And I don't even necessarily want you to be an entrepreneur. I'll talk a little bit more about that before I close this video. So, do you need to be an entrepreneur to take this class? Nope, you do not. You don't have to have an idea for a business. You don't have to want to be an entrepreneur. And, let's be very clear, for this course, you can't be a business major. If you are a business major or you plan to be a business major, you need to switch over to 422. Uh, because if you're a business major, this course will not count towards your major. 
In this course, you're going to learn about entrepreneurship through a variety of processes. There's readings and other materials and media, some lectures and short videos. You'll attend an entrepreneurial event, and you're going to practice entrepreneurship in the t-shirt project. This is a blended course, so we meet on Mondays for a lecture. And then instead of a Wednesday lecture, you have online and or team activities throughout the week. Please do not be fooled. The workload for this course is the same, or possibly even a little higher than it would be for a traditional lecture class. And that's because there's no second lecture for you to count on every week to simply give you the information that you're supposed to learn. You've got to take the initiative to identify the readings, go through them, watch the videos, recognize when the assignments are due. So I strongly encourage you right now as when this video ends, sit down and take a look at the schedule of the course and think about when you're going to spend time each week to get the work done. An obvious opportunity would be to take that Wednesday lecture period, which I know you have free, and set that aside to make sure you're doing some of the readings and the, and the, and the activities. But you're going to need to set aside more time than that. The course has a lot of activities to do and a significant number of assignments, and you're not going to want to fall behind. We're using an e-textbook this semester. This is the book. It's called Disciplined Entrepreneurship. If you're enrolled in the course, you automatically have access to it via Canvas. Please note this is a how-to book. It's not a traditional college textbook. It's quite short. Uh, the chapters are very short and cover only a few topics. Um, and that's why there are a significant number of additional readings and videos, all of which are required and all of which may be tested on the quizzes and the exams. So get to know your textbook, but make sure you're setting aside time to study the other readings and the videos. I've provided a quick summary of the assess assessments in the course. Uh, you have a couple of sort of one-off assessments, the responsibility form, which is the first assignment in the course. There's an online activity about entrepreneurship to do called SBDC First Steps that's provided by the Small Business Development Center of Wisconsin. There's a, in, you'll need to attend an entrepreneurial event during the semester. Uh, there is a reading from Harvard Business School Press uh, to purchase uh, and read as part of the finance module at the end of the course. You have a series of weekly quizzes. You have the group t-shirt project. And then you have two exams. These are non-cumulative exams. Uh, the first one covers the first three modules. The second one covers only the last three modules. Just a few notes about a, uh, two of the assignments, the entrepreneurial event, and I'll mention the t-shirt project. Um, the entrepreneurial event assignment's not due till April 22nd, um, but you'll be wrapping up the t-shirt project around that time as well. So it is not a good idea to wait until the last week to find an event, in particular because your options may be very limited at that point. There are many entrepreneurial events to attend in and around Madison, Wisconsin all year. Um, but the single biggest reason that students in this course do not get full credit for this is because they wait until the last week to, uh, to do it. They discover there's only one or two events that meet the criteria. And in some cases, they're not able to attend those events or attending those events uh, requires them to miss something else. Uh, and then they end up submitting late and don't get credit. So the I strongly encourage you, take a look at the requirements for the event. There are many, many events that are available to you well in advance of when the assignment are, is due. Um, so a little bit of planning will go a long way on this one. I've given you some direct links to organizations and events uh, around town. You're also welcome to find your own event, um, but remember that the focus of the event must be entrepreneurship. So it can't be a marketing activity, can't be something specifically about general finance like banking. Um, if you attend something that does not clearly link to entrepreneurship, you may not get full credit for your submission. Um, recruiting events do not count as entrepreneurial events. You need to find an event, an activity, where you're going to have a direct interaction with an entrepreneur. The t-shirt project is the anchor project for the course. You'll be put into groups of two or three. Um, we have a wonderful partner in town called Underground Printing based off State Street. They will be there as a resource and actually print your t-shirts for you. Your goal is to try to make a profit and to sell as many t-shirts as you can. You want to think about what will sell. Um, it's a great idea to kind of think in advance, not just what kind of design do you personally like, and that's good too, but something that you could likely convince other people to buy. Um, 
the most successful groups are the ones that start early, that come up with some interesting ideas about design or test out possible designs with friends or family or whomever they expect to sell to or find an event or organization uh, that would be interested in working with them. You can create your own group in Canvas uh, in the people section. You can go in there and just self sign up onto a team. Uh, there are already 70 numbered teams available to you. So if you've got a couple of friends or colleagues or people you meet in the first week of class that you'd like to work with, just make sure you all go into Canvas and sign up onto the same team together. If you don't do that, if you don't do that, you will automatically be assigned onto a team uh, on February 11th. Those teams, once they're finalized, are non-negotiable and non-changeable. If you're wondering how to succeed in the course, it's really very simple. Plan your work in advance and submit your assignments on time. In this course, late submissions are generally not accepted. That means that if your assignment is submitted late, even if it's done properly, it will probably not receive any credit. You should come to every single lecture. We don't have as many as in, as in a regular course. So it's your best opportunity to stay on track. The information in the lectures will be covered on quizzes and exams. So make sure that you come to every lecture. You should take notes on all the readings and the videos. I understand it's time consuming to do that and it's really easy to watch a five or ten minute video and just listen to it. But those notes are going to be the basis for your studying for the exams, which represent 50% of your grade in the course. If you take good notes as we go, you'll find studying much, much easier. And my final suggestion is get a study buddy, whether someone on, one, on your t-shirt project team or another colleague in the class. I am convinced that the students who score the highest on the exams are the ones who study with a colleague because you're much less likely to miss important information when you're working with someone else. This course is graded on a curve. Uh, if you score less than 60% in the entire course, you will receive, you will fail. If you score between 60 and 70%, you'll receive a D. Above 70%, the course is graded on a strict curve. The top 20% of students will receive an A, the next 15% an AB, the next 40% a B, the next 15% a BC, and then the last 10%, as long as you've scored above 70, will get a C. Uh, this is designed to most closely align with School of Business grading policy. Uh, I am very happy to chat with students or respond to questions about the rationale behind the grade curve, uh, but this is how it will operate. Uh, please note that that means that grades are not rounded, scores are not rounded on either assignments or the final course grade. Um, your, the grades are simply placed uh, onto a uh, uh, are just compared to each other uh, and then compared to this curve and then they're assigned the final grade score. And so uh, please note that if you have concerns about grades or scoring, you need to address those as they happen during the course. Um, I generally do not provide accommodations when students email me in the final week of the course or even after the course has ended asking to have their grade reconsidered. Um, any issues with grading or scoring need to be addressed during the class uh, during the as they happen rather than uh, at the very end of the semester. Final notes. This may sound a little odd since you're taking a class in entrepreneurship but I don't particularly want you to be an entrepreneur and the class is not designed to turn you into an entrepreneur. If you want to be an entrepreneur, I think that's fantastic. I've been an entrepreneur. It's an incredible experience, but it isn't for everyone. So my goal is for you to try out using an entrepreneurial mindset and to learn about entrepreneurship as one possible component of your career and life. If you finish this course and you say, wow, I really want to be an entrepreneur, then I'm really excited for you. But if you finish this course and you say, wow, that was really interesting, but I really do not want to be an entrepreneur, then I'm equally excited for you. I am glad you've tried it and recognize that it isn't for you because it simply isn't for everyone. I hope you'll learn something about entrepreneurship. You'll try out some entrepreneurial activities. You'll work in a group in an entrepreneurial context with high ambiguity, high potential for success, but maybe high stress as well. I do hope you'll have some fun during the course. The bottom line is you got to get started in doing something. 
We can talk about entrepreneurship all we want, but the entrepreneurs are the ones who actually do the work. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. I look forward to seeing you in class.